Good afternoon, everybody. This is the Pass Ball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com as well as St. Aloysius Parish and School over in Jackson, New Jersey. Uh, it's 6 o'clock, the first day of February 2018. Lots of stuff we're going to get into today. We're going to talk a little bit about the Super Bowl. We're going to talk a little bit of baseball and also a little bit of segment where we talk about how we could all work together to try to unify the people of the United States of America. Right now, I'm happy to be joined by a man who spent several years as an NFL quarterback, played for the Dallas Cowboys, Cleveland Browns, Houston Oilers, and Los Angeles Rams, and that's Jerry Rome. Jerry, John Pielli in New Jersey, I appreciate you having a couple minutes. My pleasure, John, and hello to the people in New Jerry, I appreciate you joining the program. Uh, first thing I want to ask you, you know, I, 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 one of the things that fascinates me about, you know, athletes, and we talk about, uh, you know, sports that go back, you know, decades and, you know, in some cases, centuries. Um, how did, you know, how were things for you as a kid, and what got you into the world of sports and football? Well, I was fortunate enough that I grew up in a football family. My father was uh, an ex high school uh, football head coach and athletic director of a really, really good high school in Dallas. And so I, I spent time riding all over the state of Texas on buses. They didn't fly in planes. And, and uh, I'd ride the bus with all the players all the time. And uh, I, I could hardly wait to, to be like them when I got to be the age of, you know, of, of high school. And my dad, you know, he, he worked with me as far as, uh, you know, I didn't want me to necessarily play any particular position, but he just, you know, taught me how to do a lot of things in football, and I'm, you know, I ended up making the decision that, I, you know, I'd like to be, I'd like to be the quarterback. That, now, was was that a tough decision for you? You know, uh, you know, getting a chance to play the game of football, you decided at some point, you know, this is this is what I want to do. What was what was it that appealed to you the most about the quarterback position? Well, I, I, for first place, I had I had the ability uh, to throw the ball, and I, it was fun uh, having more involved. Uh, that was one thing that you could do without having anyone else around. So, I, like I had in my backyard, uh, uh, two or three nets up, lined up, and and I had spots where I could where I could drop back and pretend like I was, you know, in you know uh, in a game and throw into targets in the yard and. My dad was able to show me different things, and and uh, it was just it was just a natural thing to want to be, you know, want to be a Dick Casmeyer, you know, a Princeton tailback. Uh, that I remember winning the uh, the uh, the Heisman back in 1950, and as an eight year old I was at that time, I just went, oh golly, that's I got I got to be like him, and so uh, it was just fun, and then having my my father guide me and then being able to travel all over and everywhere with the football players, um, I just, it was just a matter of, I can't wait to do it. Now, looking back, obviously your father coached you when you, you know, when you were in high school. Um, you know, what what was that like to have your father as a head coach? Because, you you know, you, you obviously grow, grew up with him. He, I'm sure he was a very good influence on you in regards to football and preparation. But then to have him as your head coach at your high school. It was a lot of fun because I played three sports. I was a basketball player and a baseball player, and he basically coached me in all of them. And then uh, uh, I know that when I was, you know, in a basketball game, I get in the car to go home, and he, he had a list of things. <laughs> he had a long list. Of, you should do this, and you should do that. So I went, okay, you know. But so he, he pretty much guided me in a whole lot of things. And and uh, but again, like riding around on the bus and and listening to the players and was coaching and how much they thought of him and I could hardly wait to, to you know to be in that same situation so that I could make him proud at the same time I knew he could make me good so uh, it, it was just uh, it was a dream it really was and hey, once again John Pialli joined by former NFL quarterback Jerry Rome now you know when you when you ended up starting your career with the Dallas Cowboys you had a chance to play behind Don Meredith and Craig Morton and, you know, was, was there anything that you were able to learn during that time, you know, from either Don or Craig? <laughs> I, uh, I, I didn't necessarily play behind Craig Martin. I mean, he and I, uh, we were, he and I together were battling Meredith 
Now, I tell you, you bring up something interesting, you know, looking back at, <clears throat> at that time, you know, the, the, the typical pocket passer, the guy that, you know, stands there, goes through a couple couple different drop settings, it, you know, that, that was the standard quarterback at that time, and obviously you were a little bit ahead of your time in regards to what you learned in college. Um, obviously, the, the game as it's progressed over the years has kind of gotten a lot more to that, where the quarterback, you know, is expected to be a little more mobile, you know, nowadays. Once again, John Pielli joined by Jerry Rome, former NFL quarterback. Now, having a chance to play in the NFL for, for a long period of time obviously gave you the acumen to eventually become a coach. What, what, would, you, what would you say you learned the most from your experience in the NFL that you were able to take with you as you became a coach later on? Now, later on in your in your coaching career, you get a chance to you know be part of the Redskins when they win the Super Bowl. How how, how would you uh, look back all these years on that experience? Oh. 
to, yeah. to the tackle, and there's three guys there. We're the ones that put that in. And, and then later on, some dude writes a book how he invented the bunch. <laughs> <laughs> And once again, uh, Jerry Rome joining the program. Obviously, Super Bowl 52 coming up this Sunday, the Patriots and the Eagles. Um, you know, in regards to the, the game, the NFL, the way that it is today, um, for, from, a, from a person that spent a lot of time playing, you know, years ago, well, what would you say is the biggest difference from your perspective in the NFL now to the NFL when you played? Yeah, obviously, I had a chance to play for, for for some of the best. I mean, you know, playing playing for him, playing for Tom Landry, you know, uh, you know, coaching with Joe Gibbs. So you you had you had a chance to see you know uh, some some of the greats and you know be alongside them. And of course, you you had your father who was there with you all along. And once again, Jerry Rome joining the program. Uh, last question I want to ask you in regards to the upcoming Super Bowl. Obviously, you have, you know, Tom Brady, a guy that's been there seven times before, chance to do something that no, really, no other, you know, NFL player has ever done, winning six Super Bowls. On the other side, you have Nick Foles, the guy who started the season as a backup quarterback, but has been a starter in the NFL, and you know, maybe you could relate to him a little bit through some of your experiences. What what would you have to say in regards to the the game as it's set up the, the you know the two quarterbacks you know Tom Brady obviously the legend that he is and Nick Foles a guy that 
you know, is getting the opportunity to start because Carson Wentz is hurt. So you'd say there's a little bit of Jerry Rome in, in Nick Foles? Jerry, I really appreciate you joining the program today. Best of luck, and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. John, it's my pleasure talking to you. Hey, that's Jerry Rome, longtime NFL quarterback, you know, with the 70s and 80s, played for the Cowboys, the Houston Oilers, amongst other teams, giving you some, uh, you know, some some good experiences. I mean, the, the, the opportunity he had to play for Tom Landry and coach with Joe Gibbs and, of course, Sammy Baugh. You know, being one of his coaches. I mean, some of the some of the greats that ever existed in the NFL. And I tell you, the one thing that I got out of that is, you know, you look at a guy like Nick Foles, who's going to be, you know, quarterbacking for the Eagles in the Super Bowl when the season started. You know, Nick Foles is, you know, hoping to hold the clipboard and be there just in case anything happened to Carson Wentz. But understood his role. Understood that he was going to be a backup quarterback, and Carson Wentz was going to be the guy. You know, Jerry Rome had a, had the opportunity to be a starter at some points of his career, but a lot of times was kind of that next guy in line. And I, I think you know if, if there was anybody that was going to be able to give you that perspective in regards to having, you know, being that next man up and just kind of waiting, you know, Jerry Rome is that kind of guy. So Nick Foles, as he's getting the opportunity to you know lead the Philadelphia Eagles in Super Bowl Fifty Two. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of people that are in that situation. You look at Case Keenum with the Vikings when the season started, he was be behind in the depth chart to Teddy Teddy Bridgewater and Sam Bradford. So you know, you never know when the opportunity is going to knock, and you know, hoping you know for Nick Foles to take advantage of the opportunity. Uh, so you know, some that never you know never come about. How many backup quarterbacks in the NFL? Uh, don't get in, don't get a snap, let alone into a game over the course of the season. And from that perspective, it's not like you're hoping for the next guy to get hurt, but you just got to be ready because you never know what's going to happen. The NFL, obviously, a very physical game, something we've talked about a lot on the past fall show. Um, if you tune into what I was talking about yesterday, just you know the the vicious nature of the game is going to lead to injuries. So to be in that spot, yes, ideally you want to be number one. You want the job to be yours, but you never know when you're going to get the opportunity because it's just an injury away from all of a sudden being your job. Once again, John Pielli, happy to be with you. Uh, once again, the number if you want to be involved in the program, 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. We were joined by Jerry Rome, longtime NFL quarterback, and he was a coach with the Washington Redskins when they won the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, the, their first Super Bowl they won in 1983. Um, you know, we're going to get into, I do want to talk a little bit of uh, baseball. Um, do want to finish up the conversation we had yesterday. We we're talking about defensive players in the NFL. And it was, it's, it's a very tough job and a lot to ask out of them. Because not only are they asked to be beast on a football field, and maybe in some cases have no regard for you know, the opposition look to hurt them and do everything short of putting them in, in, a, in a very serious injury. So they have to be bad people when they're on the football field. Now, the media kind of expects them to just play that as if they're acting, you know, as if they're just reading a script 
in a pro football game for 60 minutes to be this ferocious beast and expect them to go out there and try to inflict pain on the opposition. But once that whistle blows and that game's over, you're expecting them to be legitimately a nice guy. And I think if you look at a Charles Haley or a Lawrence Taylor or you know going back in the day, a Dick Butkus, you're, you're asking something that in some cases some of these players don't have the ability to do to turn that switch off and all of a sudden be this perfect gentleman. You know, a guy that's going to sit there and talk about flowers and roses and butterflies. But during the course of the game that they're playing on Sunday, they you know, want to do everything short of killing their opposition. I do want to let you know tomorrow where you are going to be joined by former NFL kicker Steve Christie from the Buccaneers and the Buffalo Bills. He'll be joining a program to talk a little bit uh, more Super Bowl preview as we get ready for Super Bowl 52. Played in Minnesota with the uh, the underdog uh, Philadelphia Eagles. But, uh, you know, if you're looking at the line, it's kind of creeping a little closer to four. And if we follow the last several Super Bowls that the New England Patriots have been involved in, one of the common denominators is, is every single game has been close. And you, 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 know, you look at a team that has dominated in regards to winning five Super Bowls in the last 18 years, and if they win their sixth, it's something that has not been done in the history of the National Football League. But you know, we want to call it a dynasty. And I think from what Bill Belichick and Tom Brady have accomplished, and the fact that they're playing now in their eighth Super Bowl in the last 18 years, it does have to be thought of along the lines of a dynasty. But... When we talk about the elite teams, the elite teams have dominated in the big game. And I'm not knocking the Patriots when I'm saying this, but the Patriots have not dominated in the big game. They've won a lot more than they've lost. You know, they're five and two. They could win six out of eight, which is something that's outstanding and probably will not be duplicated in the history of the National Football League. But every one of these games have been worth watching. And coming back to what happened last year and the miraculous comeback that they had in the second half against the Atlanta Falcons, you know, they they have they they've played to their competition, and their competition in just about every one of these Super Bowls has been just as good as they have been. You know, you go back to the first Super Bowl when they played Mike Martz's St. Louis Rams. The Rams were favored in that game. The Rams were coming off of a Super Bowl win the year before against the Tennessee Titans. So you know, the Patriots found a way to win that game. They found a way to beat Carolina in the next Super Bowl. They ended up beating the Eagles, who obviously they rematched this year coming coming this Sunday. And every single one of those games, even especially the two games they lost to the Giants, came down to the last possession, came down to the, you know, last break that seemed to go their way. Now, they deserve credit because they made the breaks go their way, but you know, if we're talking about the Patriots as this team that's just running rough shot over the NFL, they are in a regular season. And I know people criticize Peyton Manning for you know all the success he had in a regular season and you know only winning his second Super Bowl in his last year. Well, the Patriots have done a lot of that too. They've dominated a regular season, but as you get to the AFC Championship game and to the Super Bowl, you're you're looking at a team that is right there on level with that of its competition. There has not been a team that has played the Patriots in any one of these now eight Super Bowls that the Patriots have dominated and blown out from, you know, minute one to minute 60. So I think that's something that has to be factored in. It doesn't get brought up too much. We look at the Patriots as a, as a dynasty, and obviously Bill Belichick is going to go down as one of the best coaches in the National Football League history. Tom Brady is going to go down as one of the best quarterbacks in history. But have they dominated in the Super Bowl? No. But I tell you, this game right here will determine and will allow for them to call for a little more dominance. If they can win six out of eight, it's a lot more impressive than, you know, five out of eight. So, you know, the Patriots have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder a lot of success in a regular season and many years that have gone out that certainly 
you know, they, they've had better regular season records than their runs in a postseason. But now a chance for the second time to win three out of four Super Bowls is going to be looked at for the next 20 or 30 years. And, you know, once again, looking at the, the grand scheme of things, when you're looking at one of the best teams of all time, and Brady and Belichick are the only two common denominators over these last 18 years. And if they could pull off a win, no matter how it is that they do it, if they win this game by one point, they have set a standard that is going to be very hard for the next couple generations, the best of the best. You could grab the next coach over the next 20 years, the next quarterback over the next 20 years, and first of all, you'd have to expect them to, first of all, have cohesion between them two. Because how many times has it come to a point where a coach and a quarterback have to part ways? You know, you look at it happened with, you know, Joe Montana. It happened with Brett Favre. You know, they had a lot of success over a, an extended period of time. And all of a sudden, they had to part ways. You know, they, they you know, the quarterback decided he still wanted to play the coach you know, determined at some point that it was time for a change. And in most cases, there was a star quarterback that was ready to perform at the highest level and take his job. What Belichick and Brady have done, they've stuck together. And you don't know how long it's going to last. I mean, this could be the last run that they legitimately have in, in them. And if you look back at what happened during a regular season from the trade of Jacoby Brissett to the trade of, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo, you know, you're looking at two guys, especially in Garoppolo's case, a guy that was being groomed to be the next quarterback of the New England Patriots to take over for Tom Brady. Well, now it is up to Brady to last a couple more years. And if you hear him talk, he's the one that's that believes the most that he's got another two, three years at least left in him. And he could play potentially till he's 50. I don't think that's logical. I don't think that'll happen. But I do think he could play probably another two, three years at a high level. But I tell you, this game is debilitating. This game will, you know, knock some sense into you when you least expect it. And you know, pretty similar to what I was talking about before, that every player that's on that football field is one hit away from their career ending. And you don't know when that's going to be. Sometimes it happens in a player's rookie season. Sometimes a player retires after three good seasons in the National Football League playing at the highest level. So you never know when that injury is going to come. The one concern I do have for the Patriots going forward is the fact that they are not equipped to play at the highest level without their star quarterback. You know, Brian Hoyer is a journeyman. He's been, he's been good at some point. He's been a, a, an effective starter at some points of his career. But do you expect him, if Tom Brady were to get hurt, let's say, you know, let's use an example in the Super Bowl. You know, anything can happen. Tom Brady gets hurt first play. Brian Hoyer's got to come in. I'll tell you, the pendulum swings right into the favor of the Philadelphia Eagles. You know, Nick Foles is a guy that can start in this league. You know, Brian Hoyer is a guy that can start pretty much in an emergency situation. He is the ideal backup. But I, I wouldn't trust this guy to lead the Patriots to victory if Tom Brady got hurt in the Super Bowl, let alone next year let alone if it's week one or week two, and the Patriots have to set themselves up to get to the postseason next year. So I think it is a concern. And I do think hopefully cooler heads prevail in regards to what Bill Belichick has been trying to do, and that's to groom the next quarterback of the New England Patriots. The problem is Brady may play another five years. And if he does that, good for him. And I'll tell you, it's something unprecedented. It's something that you know very few quarterbacks have even played as long as we hit the halfway point here in the Passball Show. Once again, John Pielli with you. Number, if you want to be joined, join the program is 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. Earlier, we were joined by longtime NFL quarterback and coach Jerry Rome. We talked a little bit about you know his opportunity to play for Tom Landry, but most importantly, his father. His father had a great influence on him you know, guided him, instilled in him the interest in playing football and playing quarterback and the dream to play in a National Football League. And, you know, it certainly helped that he became his high school coach. 
and you could tell he was a very good influence on him. But I tell you, to have a chance to play for Tom Landry and coach for Joe Gibbs and play for Sammy Baugh, I tell you, that, that, is, that is an outstanding lineage to have with you and to experience that through the rest of your life. But talking a little bit, last point I'm going to make about the Patriots before we move on to a little bit of baseball discussion I want to have. You know, the Patriots do at some point and will at some point have to have somebody waiting in the wings. And, you know, not just a Brian Hoyer type. You know, Brian Hoyer is a useful quarterback. He could play in a pinch. He could start a game or two if you need him to. But he's not going to lead you deep into the playoffs. And he's not going to lead the Patriots to a Super Bowl victory if, God forbid, Tom Brady got hurt on Sunday. So I think it's important, and I don't know if the Patriots are going to go into the draft. Obviously, a very deep quarterback draft that we have coming up this year. Maybe they get somebody in one of the later rounds that they see some promise in. But at some point, you know, Tom Brady is going to have to. And I know quarterbacks don't like to do this in the NFL. Joe Montana didn't like to do it. Brett Favre didn't like to do it. You know, Eli Manning doesn't like the thought of possibly having to do that next year with the New York football Giants. But at some point... The game's going to go on without you. And if you look at what Tom Brady is doing in regards to preparing his life for out of, outside of football, he understands that the end is coming. It may, not be, it may not come Sunday. It may not come next year. But at some point, he is transforming himself into what he's looking to do with life skills and you know, using the ability that he has to reach other people. He's got his second career planned out already. So he may tell you he wants to play in the National Football League until he's 50. But I think at some point, you know, he is able to realize that he is in the twilight of his career. Does he, if the Patriots win the Super Bowl, decide to retire? I think it's probably unlikely. I think he's got enough competitive fire to want to go out there and, and at least play at the high level for another season. Once again, John Pielli with you. Once again, I'll throw the number out. It's 732-364-3598 at 732-364-3598. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll comment off of something that Dave just said, talking about uh, the possibility that Bill, Bill Parcells could have had the same success as Bill Belichick with the same players. And obviously, Belichick learned a lot of his skills and what he is uh, – been able to have a lot of success for as an NFL head coach from Bill Parcells. Uh, Bill Parcells brought him with him in just about every one of his stops, you know, outside of Dallas. Uh, you know, Bill Parcells is more of an old school head coach. So I do think there has been some, you know, understanding of the evolution of the game that Bill Belichick has picked up. And I don't know 100% if Bill Parcells will be able to get through to today's players the same way that Belichick is able to do. You know, and you saw that a little bit towards the end with his experience in Dallas. It didn't work out as well. They did have some success. You know, Drew Bledsoe was there, and, you know, he was able to, to get something out of that team. But he, you know, from the performance perspective, it wasn't the same as what was going on in the 1980s with the Giants. And those Dallas Cowboy teams weren't built on a defensive, you know, from a defensive standpoint, the way those Giants teams were in the late 90s. And, I mean, he built a great defense there, of course, with Harry Carson and Lawrence Taylor and Carl Banks. And that defense, you know, put that team up where it could compete against anybody. And remember, we're talking about a different game in the 1980s, too. You know, Jerry Rome, you know, men mentioned about how the game has changed. And, you know, the offenses are more open than they were before. And if you had a strong defense at that time, look at the 1985 Bears under Mike Ditka, you know, and uh, Buddy Ryan. The, you know, the fact that that defense was so strong, it, it means that you didn't have to ask a lot out of your offense. Just run the football, don't make mistakes, uh, you know, play the time of possession, control that and allow the defense to do what it's blessed to do. You know, the defenses, I think, were a lot better back then. You know, teams are, right now, are they're building their teams around 
you know, having a star quarterback, having dominant receivers, not just one, but two and three in some cases. Guys that are able to run, you know, you know, speed guys, but also possession guys that are, you know, willing and able to catch the ball 100 to 125 times a season. This is something you didn't see years ago. So the emphasis on a defense, yeah, you have to find a way to stop the other team. You know, the emphasis that's put on having a strong pass rush, I think, is just as evident as it's ever been. But, you know, to have that, you know, Baltimore Ravens defense, you know, when they won that Super Bowl in, in 2000, going into 2001, was the, you know, you know, to be able to do it, to be able to succeed with just that dominant defense is a lot harder to do now. Because teams are, you know, they're running you all the way down the field. Um, they're looking for the big play just about every possession. They have something set up that if it's not a, a ball that's thrown deep down the field, it's you know something that's within the middle of the field, a possession receiver that's looking through, whether it's a slant or a crossing pattern, to break something and you know move the ball downfield very quickly. So to have a dominant defense, I think, also is a little bit tougher to do now in the NFL. But once again, moving on, I did want to talk a little bit about a story that came out today. Um, former, the former first pick overall in Major League Baseball draft, and that was Mark Appel, who was drafted by the Houston Astros, decides that he's stepping away from the sport. And a guy who was, uh, belonged to the Philadelphia Phillies, the Astros traded uh, Appel to the Phillies in a deal that ended up sending Vince Velasquez, amongst other players, to the, uh, sorry, 